I'm Ann Holt and welcome to Tennessee's Black Heritage. I'm standing on the campus of American Baptist College in Nashville, Tennessee. 55 years ago, student sit-ins at downtown lunch counters changed this city forever. Many of those students came here to American Baptist to learn the techniques of nonviolent protest. Now, 55 years later, a new generation has come here to learn. On this windswept hill known as Holy Hill, overlooking Nashville, stands the 92-year-old American Baptist College, created to train black clergy. But they did not know that what they did was create a space to prepare leaders for a movement that was to come along in the 60s. The very visual representation of the civil rights struggle played out at the lunch counters of downtown Nashville. But this was not a spur of the moment event. It was a well-planned strategy. They were prepared to respond to that hour and that moment of crisis. Young students like John Lewis, C.T. Vivian, James Bevel, and Bernard Lafayette strategized the battles of the civil rights movement behind these walls. The movement blossomed here. Their efforts would lead to integration. The battle was won, but the war was far from over and lay relatively dormant for years, waiting to be sparked to life. As often happens, unlikely players became that spark. An unarmed black man accused of theft gunned down by a white police officer who was then not indicted for the killing. Just by the mere fact that we are human beings and we have a limited capacity to hold emotion and to hold stress and to hold tension, uh, there was a need for a release. Ferguson, Missouri erupted. Other cities followed. Ferguson pastor Tracy Blackman saw a situation in chaos. So if you can imagine if you went to bed one night with a relatively normal life and you woke up the next day and you're in the middle of this protest. What Michael Brown's death did, his murder did, was all of a sudden people came to realize that the system that had always been oppressive and controlling of black life to the very point that they could be killed unarmed was a reality that we thought had passed on but yet it's a reality that is experienced every day in municipalities like Ferguson. And all of a sudden people were activated around, we can't allow this to continue for the next generation. The anger was apparent. What should happen next was not. Planning was needed. Time to think, what now? Nobody planned for this. It just happened, and so we're learning it as we go. That learning process returned to familiar ground, that holy hill overlooking Nashville. In early 2015, African-American youth leaders came back to American Baptist to learn from the past and plan for the future. To be able to be in this space, um, both the historical significance of Nashville, but also the present day where we are. I've always been aware that I stand on the shoulders of my ancestors. So even though I, I'm distant from the, from the past events in time, I feel like in spirit and in what we're fighting for, because the things we're fighting against haven't changed, I, I feel the same solidarity and that same energy that I'm sure they felt when they were doing the sit-ins. What a lot of people see is the protests and the chanting and the signs, and they don't see the hard work and the long nights and the meetings that go into what a sustainable revolution looks like. And they learn they're not alone. It's very empowering to see people fighting the same struggle that you're fighting. One thing is clear, these youth activists don't see the anger and unrest as something that will quickly fade away. We see it every day on the news. We see it in our faces. We see it in our spirits, in our feelings, when you see your brothers and your sisters and your aunts, uncles, and everyone becoming a victim. And we assume that we arrive at a place of comfort, but it's false. And so I want people to be able to sit in a discomfort and the ugliness of America, even while we celebrate the beauty. The spotlight is on America, it has been on America, to do justice, to live up to the creeds of this nation in this documents. It's the spirit of who we are. 
and that spirit is being reborn again in this generation. We shot the body of Michael Brown, and Michael Brown is larger now in death than he was in life. You cannot kill the spirit of black people. We are writing a new future and want a new narrative for the next generation, and we are responsible for bringing that to bear. American Baptist College is very proud of its role in the civil rights movement and looks forward to being a part of the fight for equality in the future. A lost schoolhouse and an international superstar cross paths once again. That's next on Tennessee's Black Heritage. Welcome back. One room segregated schoolhouses like this dotted Tennessee in the pre-civil rights era. Now it's alive again as a museum honoring one of its students. They knew her then as Anna Mae Bullock, but soon the world would know her as the entertainer, Tina Turner. It's hard to believe the glamour, the fame, the superstardom began here. When we talk to former students and people who went to school with her, they talk about, you know, she always had that entertainer in her. Uh, she would find a stump and stand on top of it and start singing. Back then, she was Anna Mae Bullock, just one of the kids in an overcrowded one-room schoolhouse. The school sat in the middle of a field. Uh, it was surrounded by cotton. There were eight grades uh, that were taught at once inside. So uh, that really, you know, you really get a sense of imagining 30 or 40 kids in this one room in this little 20 by 40 building. Anna Mae Bullock, now known as Tina Turner, wrote a song about her hometown. Nutbush on the map, but her one-room schoolhouse disappeared. People had talked about the school and looked for the school for years, and uh, some of her fans and people in the, from the State Department who could never find a school. But it wasn't lost, just forgotten, hidden from view. Actually, this schoolhouse was encased inside of a pole barn. For 30 days before it was to be demolished, um, it was discovered. Once found, the idea for a museum was born. Tina was skeptical. She tells the story that she thought we were moving the white school from Nutbush. And I thought they were just putting my name on the white school. But when she actually saw a picture of the school um, on the internet, uh, I think from a magazine post um, in Switzerland, uh, she realized it and she recognized that it was Flag Grove School and it was her school. So immediately then I, I became excited and got involved. Everything did come from Switzerland, so she chose the items that she wanted to come here. Uh, she shipped a big crate. It was a huge, like, eight-foot by four-foot crate. In it, costumes, gold records, memorabilia. Tina Turner's personal designer made sure that things were done just the way Tina wanted them. They were talking to her on the phone and, and talking about the different things and what do you think about setting it this way or setting it that way. They knew exactly what they wanted and they knew exactly how to do it. In about a day and a half, the exhibits were set up and they were awesome. Now visitors can see the iconic Tina Turner items. Like um, the Mad Max. Uh, Beyond Thunderdome, the costume that she used on stage to sing that song, that she was also in that movie. What is my favorite costume is the, uh, the outfit that she uses to do her encore, which is Nutbush City Limits. And it's simply a pair of black pants and a white ruffledy shirt. But, you know, to me that's special for us because she sang Nutbush when she, you know, that was her encore and that's what she would wear when she would do that song. The museum showcases the two lives of Tina Turner from her humble beginnings to international stardom, both powered by education and determination. He came up with a design that gives you the, the glamour and the feel of where she's at 
but you also see the old school and you see her roots. Everyone has a dream, I think, uh, but I have to say that your dream cannot work without education. Uh, it's essential, or you have to depend on someone else, and that is not always comfortable. If you follow me, that's the message they hope these fifth graders will take home. You can conquer your dreams. You can do anything you want to as long as you have an education. We want her story to inspire their story um, because she was able to come from the cotton field from small, small school. Um, this, this whole school is smaller than some of the classrooms our children attend now, but she was able to make it big. And a lot of our children may have missed that story and can't connect to it. But once they come into this museum, I'm sure they'll, they'll spark a new interest for them. Even in her senior high school yearbook, which we have, the students listed what they wanted to be in. Under her name, she put entertainer. I stand for an example for poor children, determination of hard times, not letting it stop you. I hope that as people walk through the school, they see that I set an example for a hometown girl that grew up in hard times that made a good life for herself. The Tina Turner Museum here at Flag Grove School continues its mission of teaching. And now visitors from everywhere come here to learn about the little girl from Nutbush, Tennessee. Up next, some local heroes give their all to save their city, inspiring their brothers and sisters who have followed in their footsteps. You can see all of the stories from this program, as well as past Tennessee's Black Heritage programs on our website at WKRN.com. It's no secret that firefighters have a very dangerous job, even more so in turn of the century in Nashville. Back then, Horses pulled steamers to fight fires that often raged out of control. Bravery was a requirement, a requirement put to the ultimate test by East Nashville's fire station number four. As we go through here, we'll be able to put bits and pieces together. George Russell has lots of bits and pieces. This was a winter pitcher, see, and in the summer, that ivy grew up. And pulled together. Yes more here. They tell the story of Nashville's African-American firemen when this fire hall sat here in 1885. As a reward for African-American votes, and this is unusual, for their votes, they got a fire hall. Ironically, placed in its location in Edgefield, which that is Edgefield, a all-Caucasian neighborhood Engine Company 4 is commonly said to be the first African-American engine company in Nashville. In those days, fire equipment looked like this. Engine Company 4 was given hand-me-down equipment, but the same mission, to save lives and property. It would also be the first company to make the ultimate sacrifice, giving their lives. In January of 1892, a major fire just north of the capital at the Phillips Buttroff Manufacturing Company threatened the city. It brought all of Nashville's fire units into action, including Engine Company 4. Gowdy, Allen, and Harvey were positioned at the Phillips and Burdoff Company, which was over in the north part of town, off of Jefferson back in there. A third avenue north directing water onto a fire in the neighboring Weekly Warren Furniture Company where the north wall of the furniture store collapsed on Phillips Birdall property. Captain Charles Gowdy, seen here, had given up being a councilman to become a firefighter. Stokely Allen and J. Harvey Ewing were also killed. Ewing was still holding the fire hose nozzle in his hands when his body was found. They were called to do their job, and they did their job, and they did it well. Even though it took their lives, they were there to give their all. And that's what they did. They gave their all. News of the disaster spread across the country, even mentioned in newspapers as far away as San Francisco and Los Angeles. Days later, the bodies of the three firemen were honored here in the Capitol Rotunda, an honor no African-American since has received. 
Engine Company 4 continued, later becoming Engine 11, and moving to Jefferson Street, and then to Dr. D.B. Todd Boulevard. I just needed a job. William Hayes became a firefighter here in 1970. I'm kind of glad that I came here because I was taught and learned from the best because 11th had a reputation of firefighter. And uh, when I came down here, they were some war horses. <laughs> the firefighters here knew of their hall's heritage and worked hard to live up to the legacy. A lot of people said they give 100%, I gave 110. It remained an all African-American unit until 1974. We all were hired for the same cause, to help people. George Russell also served here and learned from a fellow firefighter with a familiar name, Fred J. Ewing. That's right, a descendant of Harvey Ewing, killed in that 1892 fire. It's like brothers and sisters. It's, it's a family. It's the way I look at the fire department. And I'm sure then is no different than it is today. This modern fire hall, built in 2014, still honors those firefighters who came before. From 1892 until today, they have run toward the danger to save lives and protect property. They are not black, not white, but brother and sister firefighters. You can't bring them back. You know, it's like the saying, no greater man to give his life for someone else, you know. It kinda gets you. Because, you know, that's, that's the way we work. And that's the way Nashville firefighters are today. Fully integrated now, the men and women of the Nashville Fire Department still run toward the danger, but thankfully, using modern fire equipment and techniques. A former slave helps build a post-emancipation community. That's just ahead on Tennessee's Black Heritage. <laughs> Welcome back. One of the hardest parts of the past to capture involves the everyday life of previous generations. Unlike special events, historical records can be hard to find. But Franklin, Tennessee's hard barking community is being remembered thanks to a dedicated group that refused to let the past slip away. The McLemore House in Franklin, Tennessee has a story to tell. Wood cook stove, it was the center of every African-American kitchen. This 19th century home is where Harvey McLemore lived as a free man. He bought land he worked as a slave in Franklin's hard bargain community and built this home in 1880. It is an important piece of property because of the uniqueness of a family. For 117 years, Harvey's descendants lived in the home he built. At least four or five generations. Life in the hard bargain community was hard. Women tell stories of everyday survival in Thelma Battle's book, Raining in the House and Leaking Outdoors. I remember when we didn't have the $1.25 to pay our water bill. We never did pay it. We just, just let the water stay off. We carried our water in buckets from the Baptist Spring on Mount Hope Street. We used the water to drink, cook, bathe, and wash clothes. There was a blacksmith shop next door to us that was owned by a black man, Papa Rob Hughes. He put horseshoes on them horses. There was a fortune teller that lived in our neighborhood named Aunt Lou Sharp. Aunt Lou could tell you things, and they were usually true. One day, a white man came through there to Aunt Lou's. He had lost his horse, and Aunt Lou told him where to find his horse for 75 cents. For the first half of the 20th century, an annual celebration in Hard Bargain drew thousands of visitors to the Baptist Church on Mount Hope Street. Back then, they didn't have uh, loudspeakers or whatever, but people stood around in the yards and listened, and those old fire ministers had voices that carried. We would sit in our yard and watch the people go by. We didn't go to church. We always had our own guests for the fourth Sunday in May. Hard Bargain became Franklin's first black middle-class neighborhood, home to contractors like Harvey Ewing, who built this house in Hard Bargain, 
as well as carpenters, masons, and school teachers. But they call them, they call them parlor. Retired educator Mary Mills grew up in hard bargain. I was a neighborhood runner. Everybody who needed something to call, tell my mama, uh, let Mary go get this for me. This picture on the wall is one of one of the things I get excited about. Tom Murdick remembers a third generation Macklemore in hard bargain. Maggie Matthews was a beautician by profession and a founding member of the Forget Me Not Art Club. Maggie is seated on the front row holding the sign, and that's Tom's grandmother seated on the right. When they would have club meetings, Miss Maggie needed somebody to cut the grass. My grandmother would, you know, very willingly volunteer my services to come do that. After 117 years, Father Time got the best of the Macklemore house. It needed a whole lot of uh, work done on it. It was so impossible for the last uh, tenant, uh, not tenant, but descendants to, to maintain it, so it was sold. In 1997, the African American Heritage Society and the Heritage Foundation of Franklin and Williamson County rescued the home and gave it a new purpose, renaming it the Macklemore House Museum. I suspect history will reflect that that was a pivotal moment in Williamson County history as we were restoring this house and bringing the African American history to the forefront. We hope you have enjoyed this trip down Tennessee's memory lane, and we encourage you to make your own trip through the past to discover more of Tennessee's black heritage. I'm Ann Holt. Good night. Thank you.